previous videos, we revisited some cool British singles released during the Summer of Love, and we also took a look at some cool British releases from September 1967. Now it's time to revisit some cool British singles, released in October of that year. Red Sky at Night by The Accent is one of the most underrated British singles released in 1967. This is one of the heaviest psychedelic songs recorded that year, and it's truly a shame that this was the only single they ever released, and that they never got a chance to release a full LP. The single, produced by Mike Hurst, was a commercial failure. And as a consequence, Decca never bothered to release another single by the group. The song was probably too uncommercial to have a chance in the charts but Decca Records also failed to properly promote it. Even though it got advertised in the press, none of the music papers from that period reviewed the single. And the only mention the accent got in the press was this small feature published in Record Mirror. Record Mirror wrote, Colorful clothes apart, the accent can claim a versatility that stretches from playing as a backing group for a stripper to becoming one of the most talked about hippie outfits in the North. They've been around for five years and worked under the name The Blue Blood Group until patrons at London's Upper Cut Club became so fascinated by their Yorkshire dialect. So hence the name that launches them on Decca, with Red Sky at Night. Autumn Almanac became the 10th Kinks single to reach the top 10 in Britain. The single reached number 3 on the British charts, and it was also a decent hit in several European countries, although it failed to chart in the States. Like many other Kinks songs from that era, Ray Davies' lyrics explored the aspirations and frustrations of common working class people, with particular emphasis on the psychological effects of the British class system. The New Musical Express wrote, There are few groups more capable of painting vivid and descriptive verbal pictures than the Kinks. This follows the tradition of Waterloo Sunset by latching on to everyday happenings and giving them an absorbing lyrical quality. I wouldn't class it as one of their very best discs, if only because the melody has a certain similarity with past releases, but it's a big one for sure. A week after the single was released, Record Mirror journalist David Griffiths interviewed Ray Davies and asked him about the song. The journalist asked Ray if he felt he was moving away from the basic interests of his pop audience. Ray Davies said, I don't want to communicate with just a section of the population. I want to get through to as many people as possible. I feel there's always an invisible person responding to what I do. There's somebody we're making records for. Donovan's There Is A Mountain was originally released in the States in August 1967, but it didn't get a UK release until October. By the time it was released in Britain, it had already been a top 10 hit in the United States. The unusual lyrics referred to an old Buddhist saying, and the song featured a prominent Caribbean beat. The single got very positive reviews in the press. Derek Johnson reviewed it for the new Musical Express. Completely different from any previous Donovan single release, it's a blend of South American bossa nova and West Indian calypso rhythm. The tune is catchy, and all things considered, I reckon it's very probable that the disc will emulate its US success. Derek Johnson was right. The song charted in the UK at number 8. This excellent single went pretty much unnoticed when it was originally released. However, the mod revival of the late 70s prompted many DJs to look for obscure singles to spin at mod parties. And more than 10 years after its original release, the song became a popular favorite in certain clubs and it was rediscovered by a new generation of mod kids. Furthermore, its appearance on several mod and psychedelic compilations over the years turned it into a cult favorite and the single became a very expensive collector's item. 
In 2012, 45 years after it was originally released, the single was reissued by the Acid Jazz record label. This was the only single the band ever released. But it was definitely a good one. Another great and very underrated band that released a new single in October 1967, was The Creation. The song featured a string arrangement that was slightly reminiscent of Eleanor Rigby by The Beatles. Like many other singles by The Creation, the single got very positive reviews in the press but failed to chart. The New Musical Express wrote, Another one of those discs with strong classical overtones. It opens like a Haydn string quartet, and then suddenly breaks into a thumping mid-tempo beat opus although the cellos and fugal strains are still much in evidence in the scoring. The boys generate a good vocal sound involving an absorbing harmonic blend, and the mixture of solid beat and classical influences comes across surprisingly well. By October 1967, most people thought that the Trog's days as a successful band were over. Their previous single had been a massive flop and the Trog's raw stripped down and primitive style was considered to be unprogressive and outdated. The Trog's, however, proved everyone wrong when this single became a top five hit. The song also surprised most listeners, because it almost sounded like the antithesis to some of their previous hits. The New Musical Express wrote, Now that the dispute with their record company is settled, the Trog's will need to battle to recapture lost ground, as their last release didn't register and I reckon they might well make it with this one. Certainly they should, as this is easily the best of their last three issues. It's a Reg Presley composition set to a fairly slow rhythm, with an appealing scoring of guitars, violins and cellos, plus a melody that takes a little time to register, but once you've got it in your mind, it sticks there. The single reached number three on the British charts and it became one of the band's biggest hits. October 1967 also saw the release of Family's first single. Family were formed in Leicester and they had been building a good reputation playing in London clubs such as the Marquee or the 100 Club. The band arranged Jimmy Miller to produce their first single, and it got very positive reviews in the press. The melody maker wrote, This is weird enough to make it. Strange Eastern sounds, a mid-song change of mood, a lead singer with the confidential style of Steve Marriott and a good bit of record engineering, make this an impressive first single. I like it anyway. The New Musical Express also gave it a positive review. Produced by hitmaker Jimmy Miller, this has a traffic quality about it. It's got an intriguing lyric with an unusual sitar-like sound emanating from the twin-necked guitar and a punch-packed second half. It's sensual and startling. The B-side featured another excellent song, Gypsy Woman. Even though the single failed to chart, this was the start of a very interesting career. After the release of the debut album, the band became one of the premier attractions on the burgeoning UK psychedelic and progressive underground scene. And their music was a major influence on prog bands such as Genesis. Dave D. Dozy, Beaky Mick and Titch are not the sort of group that you'd associate with psychedelia. But 1967 was such an unusual year that even Dave D. and company experimented with way out psychedelic sounds. In October 1967, the band released Zabadak, a pop song influenced by Latin and Afro-Cuban music. The song became a big hit, reaching number three on the British charts. But the real highlight here was the B-side, The Sun Goes Down. Surprisingly enough, this was one of the trippiest songs released that month. And listen to the incredibly weird sound of that fantastic guitar solo. Even though they never managed to make it in the States, the group sold an incredible amount of singles in the UK and in several other European countries. In fact, it's been claimed that in 1967, they sold more singles than the Beatles. Whether that's true or not is debatable, but this is definitely a single to get. The Blossom Toes also released their first single in October 1967. 
1967 saw the release of several double-A side singles. The Rolling Stones Let's Spend the Night Together and Ruby Tuesday, released in January, was one of them. And the Beatles did the same a couple of months later with Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. This single by Blossom Toes, however, was unusual because it was actually a triple-A side. The three songs would eventually be included on their debut album, which remains one of the best and most underrated British psychedelic records of 1967. The first side opened with one of the strangest psychedelic songs released that year, with a truly unusual and anarchic structure, and all sorts of way out effects. Mrs. Murphy's Budgerigar had a more conventional direction, with influences ranging from the Kinks to Penny Lane by the Beatles. What on, you doing there? what on Earth was an excellent psychedelic pop song with a fantastic and very memorable melody. The single got very enthusiastic reviews in the press. The New Musical Express wrote, Blossom Toes is a group laden with talent, which is exploited to full advantage. Give it a try, and I think you'll agree that there's more substance and original musical conception in this single, than in many an album. Definitely worthwhile. Despite the positive reviews, the single failed to chart. Even though they released five excellent singles between 1967 and 1969, Kippington Lodge never managed to reach the success they deserved and they remain a very obscure group from that era. The band featured a young Nick Lowe on bass and Brinsley Schwartz on vocals. Shy Boy was an excellent psychedelic pop song written by Keith West, lead singer of the band Tomorrow. The song was reminiscent of the sort of material that the Zombies were recording during that period. The track definitely wouldn't sound out of place in an album like the Zombies Odyssey and Oracle. Journalist Chris Welch reviewed the single for The Melody Maker. Once in a while, a really great record bubbles to the surface, one just came up. You'll want to listen all the way through to this sad tale about the shy boy, whose clothes don't fit, whose skin is never right, and buys a ring for a girl and finds she's already wearing one. A small gem of all British originality. The song failed to chart, but as Chris Welch said, it's a gem. One of the big differences between British and American psychedelia in the 60s was that British psychedelia tended to be more surrealist and whimsical, while American psychedelia seemed to have a harder edge and was usually more political and jam-based. This single by Rupert's People is a good example of that. The song was based on Alice in Wonderland, and it exemplifies this longing or nostalgia for childhood that characterized many British psychedelic songs from that era. The press was generally enthusiastic about the single. The New Musical Express wrote, Based on Alice in Wonderland and an excellent disc, absorbing story in song lyrics with a melodic chorus, gentle rhythm, ripping celeste, and a fascinating organ sound. Both sides of the single were excellent. The B-side, called Dream on My Mind, was a fantastic rocking song with some great lead guitar. Despite the positive reviews, the single failed to chart. Go down and blow your mind in Toyland. Another song from October 1967 that was very whimsical was Toyland by the Allen Bound. Like many bands from that era, the Allen Bound set started out as a soul influenced mod band playing club gigs all over Britain. In 1967, they decided to change their name from the Allen Bound set to the Allen Bound in order to avoid confusion with the similarly named Allen Price set. Their music also evolved towards a more psychedelic direction. The B-side, called Technicolor Dream, was another excellent song. Record Mirror wrote, Just missed a tip, but this fast-rising group are on a high commercial kick here. And this class job must stand big chances. Fantasy. Almost fantastic. Both sides of the single would eventually be included on their album Outward Bound. The album also featured a cover of Bob Dylan's All Along the Watchtower. This version actually inspired Jimi Hendrix to do the same and record a cover of the song. In 1967, the Allen Bound and Jimi Hendrix shared a bill at the Guildford Civic Hall. 
Immediately after the gig, the experienced bassist Noel Redding told the band how much they had enjoyed their cover of the Dylan song. The Allen Bound requested their record label to release the song as a single, but the label deemed it too uncommercial and refused to release it. And due to a delay in the release of their record, by the time the song was released, the Hendrix version had already been out for a month. And most people who heard their cover just assumed their arrangement of the song was inspired by the Hendrix version. I will scatter rice, paper stars in your just like the Allen Bound, Simon Dupree and the Big Sound was yet another band whose music evolved from soul and R&B towards more psychedelic material. This change of direction, however, was mostly forced by their record label. Simon Dupree and company still saw themselves as predominantly a soul band, and they later told the press that they hated the song. Despite their dislike for the song, Kites became a very decent hit. The single, which was recorded at Abbey Road, reached number 8 on the UK singles chart in late 1967. And it got very good reviews in the press. Journalist Penny Valentine reviewed it for Disc Magazine. This is a sort of Chinese version of Hole in My Shoe if you can imagine it, with Jackie Chan breathing sexy Chinese things down the mic, instead of a little girl reading fairy tales. Actually, for Teshiousness apart, it is in all ways an excellent record. And it could give Simon Dupree his first hit, which would be splendid because he deserves it. A lovely record with ethereal wind, gongs, and lots going on in a subtle backing. A record like a water painting. Simon Dupree and the Big Sound eventually morphed into prog rock as Gentle Giant. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to October 1967. See you next time.